Hey, so I've been working on a client project and they decided to send me their Vision Pro for the week for development. So I thought I would give my thoughts on the development experience for it before I end up having to send it back. To not look like a complete nerd, I think I'm gonna take it off for the rest of the video. All right, let's start with some of the very cool stuff. One thing you can do is a virtual screen. Now, there's been other devices that have done that. The Quest Pro has been the most significant one where the fidelity of the screen made it so that it was actually a pretty promising solution to use a virtual screen in VR, making it so you could get as big of a screen as you wanted. But the fidelity on the Quest Pro was just enough that it was actually usable. The Quest 2 and maybe in the Quest 3 is not quite up to the same par that you would just, uh, it'd be just as nice as using a monitor. The Quest, Pro, or the Vision Pro though, is definitely a high enough resolution where it's just as good looking at it in VR as it is on your actual monitor. One of the benefits to using the virtual screen is that you can actually develop for the application for the Vision Pro on the Vision Pro via your laptop. The benefit to that is you don't actually have to take the headset off and do another build, send it to it, and then put it back on, re-log in and all that. Now you can just build to it while you're looking at the code and then it'll deploy to and poof, there it is. This also makes it so then you could do couch coding. So you can send your, you can keep your laptop at the same place and then you can actually walk over to the couch, lay back with where this keyboard and mouse and poof, there you go, now you're coding. One unfortunate part of that though, is that if you are deploying a fully immersed experience to the device while you're developing, that when you come back out of it, the virtual screen is then moved back over to your laptop. So you would have to get up, walk over to it, grab it, and then bring it back to the couch so then you could keep working at the couch. A little bit of a negative with it is that you will want to wear the comfort strap, the, the top one. Otherwise the weight on it, it gets a little bit much. If you are laying back like in a couch or a chair, it's not quite as bad, but it will give quite the impression on the brow as it, the weight is being pushed down. All right, let's talk about the polyspatial tooling for Unity. The simulator that comes with uh, through Xcode is surprisingly well done. And the play to host application where you can just hit play and it runs straight from Unity into the simulator looks very promising. Although it's very limited in the functionality that you can do. It really ends up coming down to, you're gonna end up needing a, a physical device to do real development with it. There's just too many small missing things that aren't quite there. One thing that is kind of a, a cumbersome thing is when you're playing in the editor and doing the play to host, it does two cameras. So you, you have the camera that's in the simulator that you're using to kind of move around the environment, but then you also have a camera in Unity, which is kind of like the more main camera. So it, it's kind of a weird, like which camera am I using? Which one's actually taking the input? And for the most part, it just comes down to the Unity one. A little bit of a negative is that the simulator has those really gorgeous environments that you can kind of work, walk around in, but it, the OpenXR side of it doesn't actually utilize it. So it doesn't scan the environment. It doesn't really know anything about it. You may as well just be in an empty box. There's a couple other smaller things that don't quite work like the uh, simulated input. It doesn't show the, the system keyboard in the simulator. So you're not 100% sure is it actually triggering it? Is it not? So that's beneficial to have a device. It also doesn't do actual hand tracking in the simulator. So it's a little bit tricky to handle that if you're trying to do some kind of a hand tracking and experience. One really nice piece though, is that it does fully support OpenXR. There's a couple of things here and there that aren't supported, but for the most part, it supports it really well, particularly for the hand tracking. A good part of that is that you can actually develop for the Quest line of devices at the same time, and there's very little that you'll have to modify to get it to run on the Vision Pro. I want to talk briefly about the eye tracking on the Vision Pro. It's by far the best eye tracking I've ever tried, and I've tried quite a few devices. The only real downside to it is if you wear glasses, you're gonna to wanna to wear contacts for it unless you get like the prescription stuff for it. So you're gonna to wanna to wear contacts. For me, I'm kind of right on the edge of whether I really need the contacts or not. If things are blurry, if I don't, 
But a downside is that because of the eye configuration, I kind of have to pick one or the other, or I have to go and redo the eye calibration again because the contacts end up making a pretty significant difference for the, the actual calibration. And so a lot of the times that if I have it configured for contacts and then I go and take them out and then I try it again, it's kind of like I have to like look slightly above a button to be able to click it. That also means that you can't just hand the device to somebody. The eye calibration has to be done for each person, otherwise just slightly off. And it's kind of a negative experience when you're trying to like look above a button or down below it to click and you're trying to look around. And it's a little bit frustrating. All right, so the, the simplest comparative here is the quest 3 so the vision pro is $3,500 the quest 3 is only $500 that's a pretty significant price gap and when the quest 3 has 90% if not more of the exact same functionality it makes it a really hard justification to spend $3,500 on a vision pro but if you're already a unity developer you can take advantage of OpenXR, and then you can develop for the quest 3 and then it's very minimal to get it to the Vision Pro. So you don't really need a Vision Pro to be developing for it if you're utilizing OpenXR. All right, the last thing I wanted to talk about briefly was the, the big shocker for me for the Vision Pro, and that was the immersive experiences. Uh, I've tried a couple like 3D videos and stuff like that, but the ones on Apple TV were mind blowing. There, there's a couple of them, like the, the dinosaur experience and stuff like that. It's kind of neat. There's one, though, for the Alicia Keys one where she's doing a rehearsal with the, the whole band. And it was kind of a, an uncomfortable zone where you're, you're there, but you're, it's kind of like you've got a superpower. You're invisible and you're not actually supposed to be there. And nobody knows you're there. And it's such a compelling feeling of looking around and everything is 3d and it's like you are there and it it's a bizarre feeling but man the the possibilities that it opens up is incredible so the takeaway really is it's very impressive tech very expensive tech uh there's really nothing new about it. The eye tracking has been done it, even in a VR headset. The MetaQuest Pro did it. The pass-through, the MetaQuest Pro did it. The hand tracking, MetaQuest does it. Really, it just comes down to the Apple headset perfected it. All right, well, thank you for sticking around this far. If you like making things, uh, please check out one of these videos or check out the MakerLoop Discord. I'd love to see what you're working on. Until next time.